was invited to be here to share this story with you all, and it's something that I still can't believe happened the way that it did. I don't think I'll ever believe it happened this way. And it's, um, well, before I get into that part of the story, I, I thought I should share a little bit about myself, who I am, sort of the events that led up to how I came up with this idea, this plan. And I think more importantly is why. Why was I so passionate about it? Why did I persevere through these insane obstacles that you're going to hear about soon? Uh, my hope is that there will be some takeaways for you in the backstory as well that you can take home with you uh, that will resonate with each of you in your own way. So I should probably admit right away, <laughs> shamelessly, I'm a big nerd. You're going to gather that soon anyway. Um, my big passion growing up, my hobby was building and launching model rockets. I built dozens and dozens of them. Uh, the rocket I was the most proud of was over six feet tall, which I think is about two meters. That's me standing in the middle with my little space shuttle rocket. It would fly thousands of feet up in the air, come down in a big parachute, and it's, I can't believe my parents actually let me do this. Uh, what actually was harder to convince my parents of was letting them get my very cool vanilla ice haircut. So uh, <laughs> we all have our embarrassing throwbacks. Uh, but my favorite rocket of all was called the AstroCam because it actually had a camera on the nose cone. And it would take photos of the Earth from its peak height on its way down. And I, this was in the 90s before digital photography. And I will never forget the, the anticipation and excitement of waiting for the film to get developed and tweaking the rocket to try to improve the photos and whatnot. Uh, what I didn't realize at the time was there was this seed being planted within me, and that was a love for photography. But it wasn't until years later, until I was in my 20s, that I picked up my first camera. And I just hit the ground running. I, I, it was only probably two years after that that I discovered something called astrophotography, which is shooting the stars, the Milky Way, the planets. And when I realized you can, I could merge my passion for astronomy with photography, that was it. My, my social life ended. <laughs> I, had, uh, I spent endless nights in the desert away from any light pollution, any city lights. I would stay up all night, sometimes freezing cold until the sun came up, shooting the stars and trying to improve and learn and, and whatnot. So astrophotography can be very, very difficult because you have to do these very long exposures to get the dark sky to brighten, uh, sometimes five or eight minutes long. So, but the problem is the Earth is rotating, right? So the stars move, so you have to actually counteract the Earth rotation using something called an equatorial mount, and I won't get into all the nerdy details, but uh, I'd love to share some of my work with you. Um, I actually never viewed it as artwork. I just was using, I, I didn't show anybody any of this work for almost 10 years, and uh, it was actually my father's passing that it dawned on me, I'll never be able to share my work with him. So um, uh, my dad was also an artist, he was a painter and a poet, he was a board game designer professionally, and I just really looked up to him. So um, now because of him, I, I like to share my work more. So um, I never would have imagined I would be a professional photographer. That was not my plan, let alone standing in front of hundreds of people sharing the story behind my images. So you just never know what can happen in your life if you just pursue a small curiosity. Uh, so these are this photo here was taken at Lake Tahoe. In, um, uh, it's right on the border of California and Nevada. And uh, this is a 180 degree view from top to bottom. It's almost the whole sky. Um, I'll show you more details here. I do what's called photographic mosaics. So instead of taking one wide shot, I actually take hundreds of photos really closely zoomed in with a telephoto lens, which allows you to get really close up shots and you can blow it up huge, huge prints, which allows things like this. This took me three years to capture about 300 photos that I had to put together, like a big puzzle. Uh, this one I titled Stardust, because it, it looks like a cloud of dust, doesn't it? But every grain of sand in that cloud of dust is another sun, like ours, with planets orbiting almost every single one of them. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. A lot of adults get freaked out by this. <laughs> Kids love it, right? But adults, we have our egos, right? We don't like to feel small. 
But I think it's important that we do feel small. I think we need more humility in the world, and that's what astronomy does for me, at least. Uh, this, I was actually standing on the Las Vegas Strip when I took this. <laughs> uh, and this, a lot of people think this is a nighttime photo. This is actually a partial eclipse, so the moon is partially blocking the sun. I've chased and photographed a lot of partial eclipses before, a lot of lunar eclipses, but a total solar eclipse where the moon completely blocks the sun all the way and the entire sky turns completely dark in seconds in the middle of the day. That was the Mecca. That was something I've been dreaming about since I was 12 years old. I was in seventh grade geography class and my teacher, Mrs. Thompson, did a whole demonstration, turned out the lights in the classroom, got out a globe, a baseball representing the moon, started orbiting the moon around the earth and said every once in a while, the moon will perfectly align in between the sun and the earth and casts its shadow on the earth. And if you're lucky enough, it's very rare, but if you're lucky enough and in the right place at the right time, you can actually be inside that moon's shadow. And from earth, you'd see the whole day sky turn completely dark like it's midnight. She started showing us all these photos from historic eclipses and 12 year old me is like freaking out. I'm like, what, this exists? How did I never hear about this before? And I ran home from school and I'm like, mom and dad, have you ever seen a total solar eclipse before? I don't think so. You've never been to totality? And my dad's like, what's totality? I'm like, what? How could you live your whole life not knowing what that is? So I told myself, I'm like, I'm not gonna be one of those silly adults that's never seen one of those. So I looked up when the next eclipse will be in the United States and it was 20 years away. <laughs> Which when you're 12 years old, that's like eternity, right? I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be in my 30s? <laughs> it's like, so, uh, so I knew about the, it ended up being called the Great American Eclipse because it was all over the news. Uh, I knew about it, obviously, for a very long time. But where do you go? What do you do for this once in a lifetime moment? And this also ended up becoming the most photographed moment in history. That's a lot of pressure as a photographer. I mean, how do you get a unique photo of something that literally millions of people are also photographing? <laughs> but I have another passion, and that's flying. I, this has been my greatest joy my whole life. I uh, uh, worked really hard. When my parents couldn't afford to put me through flight school, so I had to save up my own money when I became an adult, finally got my pilot's license, and then eventually I bought my first plane, which is this. I know it doesn't look like much of a plane, but a lot of people called it my flying lawn chair. I prefer flying motorcycle. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's closest to being a bird you could, you could be. So this, with all these passions merged together, you know, astronomy, photography, and flying, all of a sudden I got this vision in my mind and I wondered if I could get up high enough in the sky, could you actually see the shape of the moon's shadow moving across the earth at 2,000 miles per hour? That was just selfishly, I wanted to see that. I wanted to witness that. And then as a photographer, I wondered, could I actually capture that? Could I do a photo mosaic and capture this fleeting, beautiful, historic moment and share that with others? And, and it happened. So once I had this in my mind, I could not get it out. I knew for sure I was not gonna be on the ground for the eclipse, but I realized, Private jets are very expensive. <laughs> and I, I can't quite afford that, even though I, I really did consider it. And so uh, about a year before the eclipse, Alaska Airlines did this whole announcement on social media, went viral, and uh, they were actually flying one of their entire planes into the moon shadow for the eclipse. It was already reserved for all these astrophysicists and astronomers and whatnot, but they were keeping one seat open for a lucky winner to be on this flight. All you had to do is submit a 30 second video explaining why you should be the one on the plane. And I'm like, this is it. This is, what are the odds like this is now just falling onto my lap, this is meant to be. So I poured my whole heart and soul into this 30 second video. I hired an animator for it. I uh, composed my own music, which I've never done before to make it all line up. I bought a nice microphone for the voiceover. I mean, it was basically a commercial. <laughs> And uh, I was looking at all the other video submissions being sent in, you know, and, and most of them were very little effort. A lot of people were going way over the 30 second limit. And so my confidence started building and I'm like, I think I actually have a decent shot of this. But the problem is they didn't announce the winner until less than a week before the eclipse. And all my eggs are in this basket. And they finally announced the winner and I lost. 
thank you. <laughs> I can't describe how devastating it was. Uh, and I, I live in New York City, by the way, so um, I'm, I'm nowhere near the moon's shadow. I'm like a thousand miles away. Now there's only a few days left before the eclipse, something I've been looking forward to my whole life. And I'm just laying in bed depressed. I finally roll out of bed, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to look at all the commercial flights around the country for the morning of the eclipse, and I'm going to compare them to the moon's shadow path. And I use maps like this. So that little strip is the moon's shadow. It's only about 60 miles wide, and it goes 2,000 miles per hour. So it didn't take me too long until I was pulling my hair out, because I'm like, what are the odds? One of these planes, I'm going to intersect it. You know, planes, I'm thinking, OK, if the plane is leaving this city at this time, flying roughly 500 miles per hour cruising, maybe it'll cross at this time. I'm like, even if this flight is two minutes delayed, it's, it's over. And right before giving up, I found one flight on Southwest Airlines that was leaving from Portland, Oregon to St. Louis, Missouri. The flight path itself was the moon shadow path. So there's no intersection to worry about. And it was funny because my dad was born in St. Louis. I've always wanted to go there, never been there. And I've always wanted to visit there, especially since he passed. And my dad's grandson, my nephew, lived in Portland so I could stay with him. And there was literally one seat left on the flight. Like, meant to be. So I, I don't even think twice. I booked a ticket. Now I have to book another ticket to get to Oregon the day before the eclipse, which was also the biggest travel day in US history. Not a cheap flight, but cheaper than private jet. Um, so I, I fly to Oregon the day before. But the biggest thing I'm worried about, it's Southwest Airlines. And for those of you that don't know, Southwest Airlines doesn't have any assigned seating. And I really need a window. <laughs> Also, I need a window up front so that the wing isn't in the way of the shot. You know, all these odds are against me already, and this is just a normal flight. So I check in online as early as I could, 24 hours before, and I get group C, seat 18. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm going to be, that's the last group, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm going to be the last person on this plane. I'm not even going to get a window. So I brought $600 with me, ready to bribe somebody. <laughs> I mean, you come this far, right? <laughs> you got to do what you can. So I get to the airport, right? First time I'm ever early for a flight. And I don't know what the odds of this happening are, but that Alaska Airlines flight, that big contest, happened to be leaving out of the same city, out of the same airport, out of the gate right next to mine. And they're having this huge eclipse party, literally a red carpet event, all these news cameras. I, I, I took a photo. It was like the universe was just torturing me. <laughs> and I see the person that beat me in the contest right there in front of me, and it's just like, are you kidding me? And I turn around, and I look at my gate, and it says, are our flights 25 minutes delayed? Are you, this is like, <laughs> I can't even describe. Uh, and so now I'm just rubbing elbows with all these Alaska Airlines people. I'm like, is there any extra seat? I have $600. I'll give it, you know, whatever. And it was definitely full. So they're all happy, celebrating, partying. They get on their flight. And I'm just feeling like my 12-year-old self, all sad. And I don't know what to do. And uh, finally, somebody comes on to the PA system. She announces to our gate, saying, thank you so much for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. There's actually a reason why we've delayed your flight today. As most of you have heard by now, there's a very historic moment happening in our country. For the first time in 99 years, a total solar eclipse is sweeping across the United States. And these three gentlemen standing next to me here are three executives from Southwest Corporate that flew out here from our headquarters in Dallas, Texas, to be on the flight with us today. And they brought eclipse glasses with them. And all the drinks are solar eclipse themed drinks. So Bloody Mary is now called a solar flare. And they're all free on the flight. So enjoy. But the best news of all is that we deliberately delayed the flight just right to ensure that we'll be inside the moon's shadow. I, I almost died from relief. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> like, <laughs> so now I'm thinking. I should really introduce myself to these executives. But first, I get my camera gear out. I put them over my shoulder. I have like all these big cameras and lenses to show maybe I'm legit. Maybe I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm wearing a NASA t-shirt, you know. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I walk up to them, and I just introduce myself. And I actually showed them my Alaska Airlines video, because it was only 30 seconds. And it shows some of my photographs and 
about myself a little bit. And they said, those are your photographs? I said, yeah, and you were, you were supposed to be on that flight, but you were on ours instead, and you flew across the country from Manhattan to be here just in case to try to take photos of it from our plane? I said, yeah, but I really need a window. <laughs> okay, come with us. I'm the first one on the plane. Like, pre-pre-boarding, they introduced me to the entire flight crew, all the flight attendants, even the captain and the first officer themselves. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. And they said, pick whatever seat you want. Uh, okay. <laughs> so now my next goal is to find the cleanest window on the plane. So I'm looking through all these windows, and I run back to the front of the plane, and I said, you guys, I can't shoot out of any of these windows. The outside of the plane is too dirty. And the captain, who's on the left, Captain Jeffrey Jackson, changed my life. He says, hold on. Why don't you sit in the front row on the left side of the plane instead? I think I might be able to get your window cleaned. I was like, okay. So the pilot himself gets into the cockpit. He gets these cleaning supplies out. He gets out of the airplane, <laughs> and he gets on that moving jetway thing, you know, you get on the plane with, and he reaches over and he washes my window from the outside <laughs> of the plane. And if you look closely behind his hand, that's the Alaska flight. <laughs> I couldn't believe how well this was going. I, I immediately thought, by the way, uh, this quote by the Dalai Lama, I'm a huge fan of the Dalai Lama, you should read some of his books, by the way. In that moment, my favorite quote by him, he says, remember that sometimes not getting what you want can be a wonderful stroke of luck. Literally 20 minutes ago, I was completely in tears and devastated. I'm almost feeling it again. <laughs> um, if I would have been on that flight, the Alaska flight, because of course I stalked their social media after, they were covered in clouds and fog and they weren't even over American soil. Anyway. It all happened for a reason. So now I'm getting treated like royalty by Southwest executives and the captain himself. And so now I'm just thinking, I might as well ask for more. <laughs> <laughs> so I start collaborating with the captain. I said, okay, look, I've been envisioning this for so many years. I really want to make it look like we're in space. Because the moon's shadow is actually going to black out the Earth's atmosphere. We're going to be able to see through the atmosphere in the middle of the daytime from Earth and the moon's shadow is going to be beneath us as well. So I need to get at, at least an 180 degree view of the Earth. But I'm only shooting through this little eight inch window, you know, so is there any way during the totality that you could turn the plane around? <laughs> <laughs> that was his response too. <laughs> He's like laughing at my, yeah, and I'm like, I, I know this is absurd to ask, and he's like, yes, it is. I, I would have to get approval by the FAA to do that. It's like, I know, and he's, <laughs> he's like, I mean, but considering it's such a historic day, and we have some executives on board, and everybody's so excited, maybe there's a chance, you know, we've already delayed it a little bit to, to be in the moon shadow, and, but don't get your hopes up. This is like, slim chance, I'm like, okay, that's, that's all I'm asking. So we climb up, we go to 35,000 feet, cruising altitude, and about five minutes before totality, Captain Jackson comes onto this intercom, and he's like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna do what's called a S-turn maneuver. And I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna do it! He's gonna do it! And I'm like sweating and shaking, and I'm like trying to take all these practice shots, trying to get all my exposures. I have three cameras going, literally suction cup to the window. And, um, and I, I'm like, oh my God, he's doing it. And I immediately realize I'm, he's not turning the plane steep enough. I'm not getting enough of the earth in and all these things. And obviously it's out of my hands now. <laughs> all of a sudden though, the flight attendants, they're sitting in the jump seat facing me because I'm right there in the front row. They get a call from the captain and they said, um, John, the captain wants to know how was that turn? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I actually did get my private jet. <laughs> it's like, actually, since you're asking, it wasn't good enough? <laughs> he said it wasn't good enough. It's got to be a sharper turn. So he climbs up another 4,000 feet, because you actually lose altitude when you turn too much. And he ends up turning the plane around five different times <laughs> while we're in the moon's shadow. And he actually sent me the flight path later. <laughs> You can see the little practice turn. Look at the last turn. It was, I mean, we were, yeah, really flying. So, 
I, 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 anyway, I can't get into all the crazy details. I know that we're uh, running short on time, and it's lunch soon, so hopefully not too many of you are hangry waiting for me to finish talking. Uh, but uh, I, I worked very hard on this photo. I, uh, I'm so excited because I don't get to share this with hundreds of people often. <laughs> I, it's not just one photo, it's a photo mosaic. I took 1,200 photos in those few minutes, and it was the most difficult project I've ever had to take on. Uh, I had to start over several times after spending many months. I had to buy a brand new computer to be able to handle all the files. It was enormous, um, a whole gigapixel large, if anybody knows photography. And it, it was, I was actually rushing, believe it or not, to get it done in time for the one year anniversary. So, uh, I, I'm so excited to finally share it with you. Hopefully your expectations aren't too high though. <laughs> but after all the hard work and 12 year old me visualizing this and all coming to, into fruition 20 years later, this was the result. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so that dark area in the bottom right is the moon shadow. Like, so cool. And the moon shadow is also above us. It's, that's what's making the sky go from day to night. So we're kind of sandwiched in between the moon shadow. And I have a little bit of um, details here. Oh, little plug. Prince. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to be the last slide. Um, Here's some uh, details. <laughs> so this is uh, the, oddly enough, it's called the corona. Um, this is the <laughs> atmosphere of the sun. Uh, so you could see like the magnetic field of the sun. You could see some solar flares. And I think we have a little bit of time. Are we OK on time? OK. This is a little detail I don't usually get to share. Uh, and surprise them ahead of time. Um, so when I was on that flight, and we're, we're on one of those last turns, the most difficult part was getting this shot. This is quite an important puzzle piece to the whole <laughs> mosaic. Because, you know, airline windows, you know, are, there's many layers of plastic and all this, and, and it's really hard to get a good, clean, crystal sharp photo. And I was, you know, frustrated because you can only really get a clean shot if you're shooting straight out the window. So if you try to angle through these layers of plastic, things get warped. And I was just like, oh, I can't get it, I can't get it. All of a sudden, those two flight attendants, they are looking through their little door window on the airplane, you know, that's angled up higher. So because it's angled up higher, it, all of a sudden they're freaking out and they said, oh my god, the eclipse is right in our window. Come here, come here, come here. Which is so amazing of them, by the way, because like, this is an amazing moment for them too. And everybody, all these strangers were just going out of their way to help me. and and. They move out of the way, and I look through this, because it's only this big, right? That little window, cross-check window, or whatever it's called. And I look, and there's the eclipse right in the center of the window. I, I realized, this is my first time looking at it with my naked eye, because I was so hung up on getting the photos and all the data in, and I almost forgot to take a photo of it, because <laughs> I was so in awe. And, uh, and then as soon as I take my shot, the eclipse is over. All of a sudden, it's broad daylight again. Somebody turned on the lights, it felt like. Uh, I didn't realize it, but I got the diamond ring moment, which is that last sliver of sunlight right at the end of the eclipse. The, the only sunlight is shining through the canyon walls of the moon's surface. And, and I got this sharp image because of that window. By the way, that window doesn't have any layers of plastic. It's solid. And uh, you can see that little star there, Regulus. It's the, one of the stars that came out during the eclipse. But talk about stars aligning and meant to be. It, it was um, quite remarkable. So um, there's a little more detail here of the Earth's surface, I'm pretty sure. Um, anyway, so thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Thinking Digital. Aren't they awesome? I hope you guys are having a good time. Now, Prince. <laughs>
Oh, thank you. It's just, uh, obviously, we've worked, we worked together before, but I haven't seen a, lo a lot of this content, so thank you for, for, oh, bringing, yeah. for, for, for showing, sharing, yeah. sharing that. Uh, if, we, if we had more time, we're, we're running a little bit short, but uh, obviously the story of creating this, con capturing this image, creating this content is, is one I didn't actually even realize it was a journey that started at age 12 for you. Uh, so that's something new yeah. I learned as well. Uh, but all, I mean, you know, the, 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 for creators, uh, there's, there's the battle to create something they feel is truly great. And then, but a lot of that oftentimes never gets seen. It just mm. stays relatively buried with you know, perhaps a small niche of, of enthusiasts and, and family and friends sort of thing. And obviously part of your story was that how this image was not only, you know, captured, but then shared and amplified to a point where it became, you know, a truly global phenomenon. Can, well, we're going to have a speaker later that's going to that's going to have an Elon Musk story, but you also have an Elon Musk story. Can you can just just can a little the, just a, a short version of 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 the remarkable story about how, you know, it gets amplified in perhaps the most intense, intensely amplified in the intense way possible. Okay, short version. I don't know how that works. All right. <laughs> so I I do photography for Twitter. I've been their photographer for about seven years, and. Um, they, this was back in 2018, weeks before I'm about to unveil this publicly. And uh, I'm on this conference call with Twitter, and it was the biggest event they've ever put on. The first time in Twitter's history, every single office from 47 offices around the world, all employees are in one room, a company, all hands. And it was my job to document it all. It was a week-long event, and you know, talk about a lot of pressure. And during this conference call, they said, OK, you're not allowed to say anything. None of the employees know. But Elon Musk is going to be the surprise keynote. And I'm freaking out because I'm a big Elon fan. And all year, I've been thinking, I have to somehow get this photo to Elon Musk, especially because I was reading his biography. And Southwest Airlines is mentioned in his biography multiple times. And because uh, back in the day, he, he couldn't afford his private jet anymore when his rockets kept blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> and his cars were also blowing up. And, uh, and so he started flying Southwest Airlines to save money. And so since day one at SpaceX in the very early days, according to Ashley Vance's book on him, uh, their mission statement at SpaceX has been to one day emerge to be the Southwest Airlines of space in terms of affordability and stuff, affordable space travel. Anyway. That's why I was very determined to meet him. And I knew how these events work. It was my, going to be my job to be backstage with Jack Dorsey and him. So I knew I was going to have some moment with him. Maybe only two minutes, though. So I wanted to give him a print. So I was planning on giving him print number one. And let me know if I'm doing OK on time. Print number one, right? And so, But I had the print made a certain way where it folds together in thirds, like a letter you get in the mail. But when you open it up, it's printed with laser on crystal. It's very nice. But when you open it up, it's seamless. So it's a nice, large image, but fits in his pocket so he could take it with him. And I had a little letter I was going to write to him. I get to the event, and he cancels. <laughs> this is like an ongoing pattern in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? This is, ah, I thought this was meant to be, you know? So I decide I'm going to write this to Jack Dorsey instead. Because I had, didn't know Jack that much. The CEO of Twitter. Much. The CEO of Twitter, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, and I didn't know him that well. But at this event, there was no press there or anything. It was very exclusive. And he gave a 90-minute opening the first day, talking about oneness and connectedness in the world. And, and I was like, and he, he led 5,000 employees into a group meditation. And I thought, this guy is so cool. I think he would really appreciate this. Mm -hmm. Print number one, you know, I don't know. So I go upstairs to this giant empty ballroom, literally the size of a football field, to get this quiet moment. And I sit down and, to write this letter. And I write the name Jack, which was so weird for me because that was my dad's name. And I write the name Jack. And I kid you not, Jack walks in the room. And he's by himself, which he's never by himself. He's usually always busy running around. And he's walking right past me to go get something. And I'm like, Jack. And he goes, yeah, what's up? And I was like, I literally just wrote your name and you walked in the room. I was, I was about to write you a letter and here, open this. Yeah. And he opens it up and he goes, what is this? I said, do you remember the Great American Eclipse last year? And he goes, yeah, it was the biggest conversation Twitter's ever had. And I'm like, didn't know that. It's like, well, I took this photo. From, he goes, this is a photograph? I said, yeah. And so I tell him the whole story. This is, mind you, 30 minutes before Elon was supposed to speak. 
And he goes, okay, here's what's going to happen. I would like you to replace Elon's speaking slot. <laughs> I had never given a speech in my life. This is how I now speak, because of this moment. Thank God Elon canceled. So I replaced Elon Musk. <laughs> and I had no preparation, right? So, yeah. You just, you never know, you never know. And yeah, I, I really take that Dalai Lama quote to heart because yeah. it gives me so much relief now just when things don't work out. It's like, it's all right. You wow. <laughs> and I, so, I mean, obviously if you were involved in communications or promotion marketing, it's literally the single best place in the world to have been in that moment to try and amplify anything. Right. Uh, and, and you having to walk into it and, and be, uh, uh, be Elon's understudy, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, another remarkable, it, John has, if you, if you get a chance to speak to him, he just has endless amounts of serendipity. <laughs> Others involving uh, Elton John, uh, Sir Elton John, uh, the Obamas, uh, and, and uh, honestly, <laughs> uh, honestly, it's, it I'm is. I'm not that is, cool, I just, I don't know why this has happened to me, but it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank Great you, Herb. Thank you all.